Hello, Rubicon of China. Uh, glad to see you at my talk called HTML or WebSockets. That's actually a recording made two months ago. I'm currently watching it live with all of you. So I hope it's still actual and up to date. My name is Vladimir Dementiev, and I'm working for a company called Evil Martians. We're a consultancy agency uh, helping other teams to grow their businesses, to build features, to improve the performance, and so on and so forth. I'm primarily a Ruby developer these days with a bit of Go. And officially, my title is Principal Backend Engineer. And that's described the situation the web development currently in. We have a, usually we have a clear separation between front-end developers and back-end developers. So two different teams, two different like worlds, and I'm currently part of the backend world. But that's not the thing. Uh, it's not the way it used to be all through all my career. Uh, about ten years ago, when I just started, uh, I was a kind of full stack developer because like most Ruby and Rails developers were full stack. Uh, we were writing both server-side code and a bit of HTML, and even JavaScript or CoffeeScript and even CSS and so on. So I was able to build a product on my own because uh, full stack Rails those days and today actually followed a simple rule, sending HTML over the wire. That's the main principle of a full stack Rails of 2010s or even 2020s. And we, have a, we had a plenty of helping tools to build full stack app, web applications, like preprocessors, uh, CoffeeScript, SAS, Turbolinks, um, different ways of dealing with assets and so on and so forth. That was our front end stack. But then the situation changed and the front end evolution began. JavaScript evolved into ECMAScript 6, 7, whatever. Uh, post CSS uh, was born actually at Evil Martians as well. And uh, Ruby and Rails applications started to become only API providers. Like uh, front end got separated into its own stack, like with React, the most popular framework for building front end side of the apps. And that's where we are are now like we have backend engineers building business logic rules and APIs and we have front-end engineers building UIs. So the question I'm kind of talking about today is whether full stack Rails development is possible, is competitive in 2020s. Uh, could it compete with React, uh, Svelte, Vue, Angular, and so on? Uh, in building modern interactive front-end applications? And the short answer is yes. And uh, that's actually a bit off topic of today. And that's covered in my recent RailsConf talk called Frontendless Rails Frontend, uh, which covers all the possible, all the major like things we have in the modern Rails stack which help us to build interactive applications without touching the front-end zone. And today I would like to cover the most important, in my opinion, part of it is a HTML over WebSocket technology. The technology that allows us to build really interactive and reactive applications without writing JavaScript, we can continue writing everything in Ruby and having a Rails server or Ruby server, so it's not Rails only, uh, to be responsible for everything. So no state duplication, no team mm -hmm. separation, like, like in good old days of Rails golden age. So HTML over WebSockets, the overview, that's the goal of today's talk, to discuss the different uh, designs of such applications, different tools, and uh, how we can use them and actually when. 
So let's start with the first one. We can't wait uh, to talk about not only Ruby libraries today, but also something from the outer world, from, for example, Elixir world, because the whole revolution of this new way of thinking for building web applications with HTML over the WebSocket uh, started with Phoenix Live View. Not actually started, but became popular, that, to be honest. So Phoenix Live View released about three years ago. Uh, was a new, like, new, very revolutionary idea for the most web developers, for the younger generation. Because it's, again, it's not truly new idea, but it wasn't so popular 10 years ago because WebSockets were a bit harder to maintain, maybe. So Phoenix Live View is a framework which allows to build reactive web applications uh, with Elixir Phoenix framework without writing JavaScript. The idea of Phoenix Live View is the following. Uh, we have HTML elements, DOM elements, and we associate them with uh, Erlang processes, connecting them through WebSocket. And then every user action is transmitted to the server, to the corresponding process, and the process decides whether we need to render something new or not or whatever. And on the client side, which is important, uh, and again, it's something new, which hasn't been possible um, 10 years ago, we use a morph DOM uh, library to perform fast DOM patching. So instead of simply replacing the contents of HTML, like setting inner HTML for a DOM element to something new, to a new stream, uh, Morph DOM updates only attributes or nodes that change. So, for example, if you edit a class, it just calls class list add. Or if you edit an attribute, it uh, adds an attribute and so on and so forth. It's much faster. It doesn't require repainting uh, the whole element or the whole DOM tree. So that makes uh, that's one of the key uh, building blocks of HTML WebSockets applications faster uh, DOM rewriting. Something that actually React implements by their re-rendering mechanism, which is a bit complicated. So this is a universal library that allows you to do that. So this is, let me like demonstrate you how Live View works. This is, yeah, that's not Ruby, but that help would help us to understand uh, the basic concepts of the approach. So imagine that we have a browser, a web page, and we have a server running Elixir Phoenix framework. Uh, and we have a DOM element, which we want to be a live element. So whenever this element is added on the page, it connects to Erlang process. Like it creates an Erlang process on the server by invoking a web, by sending a WebSocket message, like an initialization message. And, uh, then whenever a browser event occurs like click or whatever, uh, this event could be sent to an Erlang process handled by it. And in response, this process sends a partial HTML update. And that's another great idea of uh, live view. We're gonna talk about it uh, in detail a little bit later. So what's good about this using this kind of architecture when every element is associated with a, a dedicated Erlang process, an actor in the Erlang VM, is that it could also react to internal events. This way you build broadcasting and other features like adding real time to your application. And everything is handled by this process. So logic is uh, isolated in a single place. And yeah, this could be repeated for other DOM elements, for other browsers or web pages. So regarding partial HTML updates, let's take a look at an example template. So I'm using ERB syntax here, but it's actually pretty similar to Elixir templating language. So imagine we have a, a live element with two states, like checked and unchecked. It's like a item in a to-do list. And we can see that actually, there are dynamic and static parts of it. Uh, and whenever we want to re-render this element, we don't need to update static elements, right? So we only want, we only can update 
the dynamic elements. So here we have uh, four dynamic elements uh, indexed uh, by the order they appear in the template. And whenever a process sends an update, it actually sends only the contents of the updated dynamic elements using the indexes. So this way, the amount of data sent uh, through network is minimized uh, like as much as possible. And that's another cool feature of Live View. So to sum up, Phoenix Live View, which gives uh, this idea a new breath, uh, has the following key features. First of all, it's a component-driven ar architecture, actually, because every life element is a like isolated element, not connected to anything else. It has a, a correspondent representation of the server as Erlang process. Secondly, like using Erlang VM with its building concurrency and actor model is good fit for such kind of application. We can send messages between process and the server and update data on clients uh, kind of transparently. And a dedicated templating mechanism is what makes life view blazingly fast. But let's return back to Ruby. Uh, that's why we are here today. Uh, in the Ruby world, uh, I would like to start talking about the first framework or library called Stimulus Reflex, which implements similar ideas, but in a very different way, actually. So Stimulus Reflex is a library to build HTML WebSockets applications in Ruby and Rails. And it's actually a pretty old library. It even predates uh, Phoenix Live View a bit. Uh, but what's more interesting, its core part, a library called Cable Ready, is much older. So it's about a year older than Live View. Let's first talk about Cable Ready. Uh, what, is, what is it and how it can be useful? So Cable Ready is a library uh, that allows you to modify contents of the page remotely, like by sending commands or operations from a server to browsers, to a single client or multiple client, as you wish. So it uses Action Cable under the hood as a transport as of today, but the next versions would be transport agnostic. And it also uses Morphdom to update HTML. Let's take a look at the example. So assume that we have a template uh, and we want to re-render it or do something like, for example, delete an item. So here we have a button, we, we use Rails unobtrusive JavaScript uh, to perform an AJAX request. So this is remote true uh, attribute. And in our controller, in order to remove this item from the page, we use cable ready uh, transformation or operation. Uh, we initialize a uh, stream uh, from the item name, like a unique stream identifier, and we send remove command with a specified selector. This is pretty similar to what we used to write uh, when using uh, JavaScript templates with jQuery, again, 10 years ago. Uh, th the idea is kind of similar, but there are two differences. First one is that Cable ready is declarative. You don't write code. You just define commands with a predefined set of arguments. So declarative is imperative. And uh, secondly, it's built on top of WebSockets and it gives you an ability to broadcast changes to all the clients simultaneously out of the box. So it gives you synchronization between different uh, browsers, out, uh, like like uh, in no code, no additional code, because you use uh, streams and ca action cable broadcasting mechanism. And out of the box, uh, cable already pro provide dozens of different operations you can use. So you can, you can actually do pretty much anything uh, in your browser by sending commands from the server. And then the future version cable already uh, will support uh, custom operations. So you can register your own operations and use them. So it's extensible as hell. Let's come back to Stimulus Reflex. What is Stimulus Reflex? So on the one hand, 
Stimulus to Flex is a kind of a framework built on top of Cable Ready. It still uses Cable Ready for DOM updating part, for sending HTML, for broadcasting, and so on. But it also provides a way to react on user actions, to handle events coming from users, like browser events. And for that part, actually, Stimulus is used. So let's get, take a quick look at what Stimulus JS is and why, again, it's important here. So Stimulus JS is a separate library, JavaScript library, uh, born at Basecamp, which allows you to add very s simple interactions to your page, or maybe complex, but it was built for uh, as a library for JavaScript sprinkles. So for adding uh, tiny interactions. Like here, for example, we had a hideable banners on the page, so a user can click on a close icon and hide an element. Like very simple functionality. Uh, years ago, we could write it with jQuery uh, like this by defining event handlers for a particular CSS class and adding tons of code to make it work across different uh, technologies we could use, like uh, we need to take care of initializing events for Turbolinks, for jQuery, UGS, like Ajax updates and so on and so forth. And uh, to, to perform such simple task, we, we actually wrote a bunch of jQuery, jQuery spaghetti. With Stimulus.js, uh, the same functionality could be written like in a few lines of code. You don't have to define uh, event listeners. You don't have to define initialization uh, code because everything is happening kind of automatically. Uh, stimuli activated uh, whenever an element is added on a page. They use a Mutation Observer API, some modern API in the browser. And uh, you don't need to care about anything. You just drop an element, a data controller attribute, and that's it. And your element, static HTML element, becomes an interactive element. And uh, it's something similar to custom elements uh, API that you have in the browser. And we're going to talk about it a bit later today in conjunction with Turbo Strips. So Stimulus is used to handle this, uh, to initialize reflexes and handle user events. The complete architecture of Stimulus Reflex was, uh, I don't know, its own conference because uh, it's a kind of sophisticated. The framework is, provides almost everything you can imagine uh, you need to use with a, like, a reactive application. We're not going to talk too deep uh, today. Instead, I, I, again, I would like to demonstrate a schema of how that works. So first, we add a DOM element on the page and we attach a stimulus controller to it, which uh, initialize a WebSocket connection and uh, send browser events to a server. But unlike Live View, there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between reflexes and DOM elements. Reflex class is more like a controller. It initializes for every action, for every event, uh, in new instance, it's like uh, temporary and uh, it's only used to prepare the response. So in response, we perform a cable ready operation and cable ready operation is not going directly to this DOM element. It's not scoped to it. You can perform a cable ready operation to update the whole page, for example, by reacting on a single element uh, event or different parts of the page, multiple parts of the page. That's again the difference between live view component based approach and stimulus reflex. It's not scoped to a particular component by default. And uh, regarding out, out of browser events, you can just use cable ready. So without anything, any other wrappers around stimulus reflex. And similar happens for all elements on the page. Let's take a look at the example. This is our to do list. Uh, and we can complete or delete items. So we can see that uh, at the first browser where we perform actions, we also have a flash messages and 
the second browser, we can see that all the actions are synchronized and that's an example of collaborative work. Let's see the code. So first, uh, our template. We add data reflex attributes uh, describing uh, which actions, which events we would like to handle and which reflex class must be used for that and reflex action. So change is an event, list is a reflex class, list reflex, and toggle item completion or destroy item are actions defined in this class. So here is our reflex class. Uh, so here we define actions and we can use uh, cable ready out of here to broadcast changes to everyone. We can use morphs, uh, which uh, wrappers actually over internal cable ready channel for this particular uh, client, which used to update element for this in this particular browser or parts of the page or the whole page or whatever. And with every action, we also have an access to element data set. So data attributes of the element are passed along the action. And that's the, that's the way we kind of keep state across uh, the actions. So morph is just a kind of a wrapper of a cable already update uh, with a specified selector. So stimulus reflects in the whole framework with its own abstraction layer with reflexes, uh, which is used to update the DOM. But again, I would say that they're pretty similar to controllers and the, probably they could be interoperable, interoperable in the future. Uh, the key difference is that every reflex could update pretty much anything on the page. It's not scoped to a particular element or DOM tree. And uh, that gives you an opportunity to do pretty much anything uh, in your reflexes to update whatever you want. Uh, originally, Steamers Reflex only supported updating the whole page HTML uh, in response to action, like similarly to Turbolinks, but faster over WebSocket with Morph DOM and so on. And that was pretty easy, easy way to build reactive applications. But today's stimulus effects also supports updating particular parts or sending uh, other, other commands. What I like most about stimulus effects, it's actually pretty stable in major software. And I believe at the time of this uh, talk gonna be presented at RubyConf China, it's V4 at least uh, release candidate or beta would be out. Uh, also, one thing that bothers a lot of people in the Ruby community re regarding WebSockets is uh, scalability and performance. So Stimulus Effects works fine with any cable, which I'm an author of, uh, out of the box. And I would say that it's scalable. There is no problem in that. Also, Stimulus Reflex has a very, very comprehensive documentation with a lot of examples and use cases covered and an active Discord community, which is useful not only for those trying to handle uh, WebSockets uh, in Ruby, but other general Ruby topics, Rails topics, uh, and so on. So uh, recommend to checking it out and joining this community. But let's move to the next thing so streamer reflex is cool, but we need competitors uh, in order to have better tools for everyone, right? So, and the main competitor kind of of streamer reflex as of today is Hotwire. The new magic behind the new Basecamp product called Haycom mailing service. So what is Hotwire and why there is a lot of hype around it? Why this conference is called Hotwire? <laughs> Let's talk about it today. So Hotwire consists of three like parts, three frameworks, I would say. Turbo, Stimulus, we already talked about it. So it kind of uh, acquired by Hotwire. And Strata, um, I can say anything about Strata. It hasn't been open sourced yet. It's something for building uh, mobile applications with Turbo and Stimulus, I guess. So Turbo, uh, Turbo in it, it, uh, itself is could be split into three parts. Turbo Drive, it's actually Turbolinks, but with a new name. Turbo Frames is more like an extension to Turbolinks, 
to update not the whole of the page, but part of it. And turbo streams. That's something we want to cover today because turbo streams allow you to perform DOM manipulations by sending some commands uh, presented as HTML elements to the clients. Uh, if you want to take a look, deeper look at Hotwire, I would recommend to first check my blog post uh, at our Evo Martians Chronicles. It talks about all the parts of the Hotwire, frames, drive, and streams as well. And also another good talk on Hotwire is from the RailsConf called Hotwire Domestified by Jamie Gaskins. Uh, goes into deep of how things implement it and uh, compares Hotwire approach with a, a React SPA approach. But let's come back to our topic and talk about turbo streams. So turbo streams uh, by the functionality is closer to cable ready, but it only provides currently five actions, not 35. It's transport agnostic, though that's its good part. It doesn't uh, care about the way you transmit this uh, streams, streams data. And it doesn't require any JavaScript to trigger updates. Uh, everything is built on top of custom HTML elements. And let's see how it works. So again, we have an application um, and a Rails server with a hardware attached. Uh, first, that's what differs uh, from others. In order to initialize a subscription, we use TurboStream source element. So we create an HTML tag, uh, TurboStream source with uh, some data attributes uh, like stream name. And uh, after you edit on a page, it initializes an action cable subscription and removes itself. So it's kind of disposable custom element, which only purpose is to initialize an action cable subscription. So you don't need to do that man manually, you just need to render an element on the page. No JavaScript required, that's cool. Then uh, you don't have a way to send events through streams. So streams are one directional, they only come from server to client. That's actually the difference between the stimulus reflex and others. So streams are one directional only for streaming updates. That's why they're more like cable ready, actually. So you perform an action using uh, get, post, or whatever. So for example, deleting an element on a page, uh, you perform an Ajax request as in the in originally. And it's handled by the Rails controller. You don't need an, any other new abstraction to work with streams. You can still use your controllers. And in response, uh, controller returns a turbo stream element which contains a template uh, HTML template to replace or add to the page depending on the action you choose and whenever this turbo stream element appears on the page uh, it again self-destruct and uh, perform a DOM update similarly if you want to broadcast changes to many clients, you can just use the action cable and broadcast stream elements to this subscription. So here is how it looks uh, from the code perspective. This is, we use Turbo Rails library, which provides some helpers and action cable actually integration because without Turbo Rails, streams are kind of um, hard to use because there, there is no transport uh, attached to them but Turbo Rails provides an, an integration with Action Cable. So Turbo Stream from creates this stream source element and initializes a subscription. And then in your controller, you use a specific Turbo Streams channel and uh, send actions. In this case, we send a panned action and we specify an element where we want to add then the item, the partial, uh, and some like locals to render this partial. So that's how turbo streams work. Uh, there are a few more, like two more at least, libraries uh, to build HTML WebSocket applications in Ruby and Rails. 
first one is motion uh, and the second one is life it's pretty new so motion <clears throat> built on top of two ideas first it used view components uh, to describe life elements and uh, again it's used action cable and morph dom as well so motion is actually more closer to life view because it's com use component based approach everything is isolated no like uh, no way to update everything from a particular element but it's still i would say in, in a development phase that's something to would like to watch for so maybe that's future uh, of the HTML web socket maybe not at least we have alternatives life is a brand new library it's still very young but it already works and work for uh, basic examples it's a library by Samuel Willis the author of async uh, and all that uh, stuff around async and auto fibers and Ruby so I think that's more library built for to be a proof of concept of an async uh, communication in Ruby but again uh, it's pretty close to what live view does because we have live elements and dedicated Ruby objects uh, on the server side which handle events and could re-render the data so live uh, is another uh, library to watch for in terms of HTML or web sockets. Uh, let's do some recap what we talked about today, actually. So HTML or web sockets. So HTML web sockets is a key feature of new full stack Rails development. Without it, uh, we wouldn't be able to build truly interactive and reactive application applications because well for modern web development uh, HTML and Ajax is not enough we need more and that's what HTML websockets gives us we have multiple implementations of different level of maturity like stimulus reflex and cable ready have been used in production for I guess many companies already so and we know that uh, there are some big players using Steamers Flex and Cable already. Hotwire is backed by Basecamp and is definitely getting more and more popular and will be more and more popular as soon as Rails 7 come out because it's going to be included into its jam file by default. So Hotwire is kind of a, an official way of building Rails uh, web applications of the future. So at least as we see today for the Rails 7. And uh, when this approach is applicable or not, everything is cool. Like this is a cool technology. It's top-notch technology, web sockets, morph dumps, HTML, our web sockets. That sounds really cool, but do you really need it? That's a, the most important questions. There are some concerns regarding mm, the downsides of using this approach. I'm not talking about them on this slide, but I already mentioned them during the talk. First of all, scalability of sockets. And it's not only in terms of handling thousands of connections, it also in terms of keeping clients state. So the idea of HTML over the wire is to keep the state on the server, not on the client, at least not on the client. And, uh, that would require a large amount of memory, for example, especially in Ruby. So keeping objects in memory is not cheap. And we can see that by at action cable for action cable performance, which is not that good in that in the memory part. Uh, that's one of the concerns. It could be mitigated by moving states out of the Ruby processes somewhere, but that requires some work. Uh, WebSocket scalability could be solved by either using any cable, first of all, of course, uh, then uh, I think in a year or two, async would be uh, like at least the number two on this uh, 
on the list of what to use for WebSockets. So we're still waiting for the integration with the Ruby build and Fiber Scheduler. So we'll see how it will go. And finally, and what we can also see in the evolution of Stimulus Reflex and the, in the design of Turbo Streams, we can actually fall back to other transfers like uh, long polling, server send events, or whatever. So which are not so reactive, especially long polling, and but could be maybe a bit easier to scale. So anyway, we are not limited by WebSockets, which should be probably called HTML over real time wire something, right? Because WebSockets is just a transfer. And uh, speaking of when this approach could be uh, helpful today, could when you can benefit of it. Uh, is there a multi free free kind of situations I see it should be considered. First of all, uh, you already have a Rails app or you just want to start to build a new Rails app and you don't have a front-end team and you actually don't have a, uh, like resources to hire a new team, the whole team of different engineers. You have good Rails engineers and that's the case when you would like to start with uh, this approach, at least for the initial phases of the products for MVPs for first versions, that's pretty good. Uh, then another thing to consider is whether your application is actually could be local state or not. We can see that many SPA applications that they're actually going kind of a calling server from almost every action user clicked somewhere, we send a request and return a response, user did something else and so on. So when the amount of operations, action, user actions uh, requiring server response is much more than the purely local operations that could be managed by the local state, then I, I would say there is no reason to keep the local state at all because if you go to the server for every action, so why not just move in everything to the server and just and just make the client render HTML and so on, and that's it. So that's the second case. And uh, that, for example, for different admin-like interfaces for CRM systems or whatever, we have forms, tables, uh, even with filtering, searching, whatever, that's a good case for HTML or WebSockets. And finally, another a good example is a legacy Rails applications, which could still use uh, good old JavaScript templates, jQuery, and all that stuff. Uh, and they would like to be more interactive, to be more maintainable, actually. Uh, moving, gradually moving to HTML WebSockets would help here as well. So probably the only case where you don't need to consider HTML WebSocket is when you already have a product with a back end, a front end separated and everything doing well. <laughs> like in that case, like you're doing well, don't need to change anything. Otherwise, that's a you know, viable option. So that's probably everything I would say today. Uh, and I'm ready to answer your questions. Thanks for having me here virtually. Uh, but anyway, so here are my contact details. Thank you very much. I'm waiting for your questions. Hello. Uh, uh, Vladimir uh, Dementiev is Evo Martins company. Uh, 呃，这次是出于这个金数据赞助商的支持啊，由金原来金数据的工程师袁晓峰邀请到的这个 Vladimir Dementiev。然后大家有什么问题可以放在 YouTube 的那个呃 Chat 里面，也可以在我们的微信交流群里面提出。然后我们接下来就进入 Q&A 环节。Hi， yeah， can you hear me？ I okay.
I, I found some questions from the first from the Witcher group that someone asked like um, how is the concurrency ability of this project uh, of Hotwire um like uh, projects that may have the uh, more than ten thousands of like concurrent like connections or something like that. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Wait, what? Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Ah, uh, okay. You? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I carry I carry question, so um, I, I was thinking. Okay. <laughs> Will you repeat it? Uh, yeah. Audience, yeah, then, for uh, sure. Okay. Like okay. someone asked, like for uh, Hotwire, how how is the concurrency, like the performance on the situation that where there there may be more than like ten thousand connections at the same time. Yeah, I, I get it. So. Specifically for hardware, uh, it should be pretty easy to scale because uh, from the WebSockets point of view, all they use is uh, broadcasting data from the server to the client. So client to server communication is still uh, done through AJAX, so like HTTP requests, and only live updates are sent through WebSockets. And the good thing about hardware is that technically it's possible to use pretty much any transfer for that and not only action cable not only any cable even so you can build your own solution to tr transmit hardware updates and so like you can use some even public uh, web socket service like I don't know what's popular in China like pusher uh, Twilio PubNap any any of them could be used with hardware with there's a bit amount of custom plugin writing. So for hardware scaling, it's easier. So you can move all the web sockets out of your Rails application easily. And that's what actually we do with any cable pro version, which allows you to use hardware without even uh, using Rails plugins for that. Okay. So um, Chloe Ray asked that is it possible that um, we could implement um, any cable like for Ruby version with the async gem like by the Samuel Williams, I think? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, sure. That's, that's actually one of the popular questions from the first day is of any cable. Is it possible to implement any cable server in Ruby? And uh, we already have one. It's not an async based, it's just a rec hijack based uh, general server, any cable rec server is called. Uh, but yeah, uh, so any cable server, the one that's responsible for WebSockets, is kind of a separate piece of software and run in a separate process, and it could be implemented in theory in any language. Uh, and will it make sense to build it in Ruby? Well, for from for some reasons, yeah. So like one of the reasons is that uh, you can keep everything in Ruby and it's easy to run, especially locally or in test environment. So you don't care about uh, all other infrastructure parts. Uh, from the performance point of view, so async uh, and out of fibers uh, could be almost as like performant in terms of uh, latency as. Uh, other language solutions like currently we use Golang, but in terms of memory usage, still like I don't believe Ruby will ever be uh, as like as minimal as like binary compiled languages. So there's there still will be a, uh, a lot of reasons to use WebSocket service written not in Ruby, 
but for smaller projects, for staging development, for any like demos, uh, using Ruby-based service would make sense. Definitely. Okay. And um, someone on YouTube asked like for current like implementations for the HTML over WebSocket, like there might have some user experiences problems when the user have a very high latency. And in these cases, like you may, you might have to manually write some uh, waiting animation or something in the stimulus controller. And this stuff may not like fit for all the situations. And is there any good solution for this, this problem? Good question. Thank you. So uh, I don't think like about good solution because like like something well uh, not hard to hard to define. But uh, for example, folks from Stimulus Reflex, uh, they did a great job uh, on making on covering all the use cases. So and their front end library uh, provides lifecycle hooks to deal with. Uh, this situation, so to tracking uh, the start of the action, the the end, and so on. So you can, you, you have to write some code yourself, right? So um, JS code likely to deal with loading state, um, but they provide useful APIs for that. And also, I know that there are some attempts to um, build optimistic updates uh, APIs to it. So for that, I would recommend taking a look at Stimulus Reflex and their guides and docs, how they deal with this problem. Yes. It somehow sounds like, like it it might depend on your business model or something like that, right? Yeah, sure. So like, I, as I said in the end of the talk, so this approach is mostly useful for non-heavy interactive user-facing okay. applications where you you usually don't care about such things as optimistic updates. So don't forget to put a loader uh, to notify users that something happening. Yeah. And uh, there's another question from the Witcher group from Eric. He said, like, uh, for the product, like, of the AnyCable Pro, that it it is said that they will they might have like multiple backend support later so which means like it might not only support rails so after that like um is uh would it be like a new action cable protocol or it's somehow like a compatible protocol things or something like that yeah Yes. <laughs> so the short answer is yes. And actually I'm working on like a new version of protocol for a long time. Like like in theory. I even started to writing kind of a draft RFC for that. Uh, and that's the plan for the kind of any cable version two. And that's why we recently released a custom client side library, JavaScript library to communicate with action cable servers or any cable client is to migrate to a new protocol under the hood. But the good thing that I want to keep compatibility with the current channels API. So from the code perspective and from the client side perspective, uh, the code, the existing code would be the same. So it's going to be backward compatibility, but there are plans on adding some additional features on top of that, some like uh, presence tracking, probably uh, building to the protocol and uh, handling short-term disconnects when you don't have to resubscribe to everything, but you can just restore the state uh, if there was a short-term disconnection. Like, you know, like you were uh, going underground uh, for a moment and you lose your network and then you come back and then you restore everything without even doing anything on the code side. That should be part of the protocol. So that's the idea for the uh, action cable, or it's going to be any cable V2 protocol. And that's kind of the plan for the next year. Okay. I see I see a lot of people are very curious about your cat. Like, it's very cute. 
I, yeah, my, my, my cat is like, uh, he, he loves to take part in online conference uh, awesome. stuff. Every, every time I do something, he either mails or just comes to my table and uh, shows his love. But that's not actually true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, let me check if we have any other questions. I think that we don't have like any more questions. Do you have anything else that you want to share with us? Oh, that, that's pretty kind of like uh, you know, interesting situation because the video I recorded on uh, like in June, like a, mm. a long time ago, it was even before we announced any cable pro and uh, some other additions to it. Yeah. So we'll probably at this announcement, so the pro version is available and it brings performance boost and especially uh, regarding Crossfire, there are some specifics that let me just think, uh, send a link to our blog on uh, Hotwire uh, integration in the pro version, which I already mentioned. So yeah, that's the main uh, announcement, so I'm currently working kind of full time on any cable. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of great ideas to implement in the future, so uh, stay tuned. Feel free okay. to ping me uh, whatever you want and ask questions if you want to try. So that's it. And uh, here's the link. I sent it to YouTube uh, stream. I'm not sure everyone has access to it, but I guess so. Okay, thank you. And. I'm very glad that you could join us with this like conference. Like, yeah, me too. Thank you yeah. for having me. Uh, I hope someday I will be, it will be possible to uh, meet in person at Tribeca, China. Yeah, so, we all miss we that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.